everyone. The June 14th, 2021 meeting of the Seattle City Council will come to order. It's 2.01 p.m. I'm Lorena Gonzalez, president of council. Will the clerk please call the roll? Lewis. Present. Morales. Here. Peterson. Here. Sawant. Present. Strauss. Present. Herbold. Here. Juarez. Here. Council President Gonzalez. Here. Eight present. Thank you so much. Uh, presentations. I'm not aware of any presentations for today, so we'll move to approval of the minutes. The minutes of the City Council meeting of June 7th, 2021 has been reviewed. If there is no objection, the minutes will be signed. Hearing no objection, the minutes are being signed. Will the clerk please affix my signature to the minutes? If there is no objection, the introduction and referral calendar will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the introduction and referral calendar is now adopted. Approval of the agenda. If there's no objection, the agenda will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the agenda is adopted. Colleagues, at this time, we will open the remote public comment period for items on the city council agenda, introduction, referral calendar, and the council's work program. I thank everyone for their ongoing patience and cooperation as we continue to operate this remote uh, system, um, public comment system. It remains the strong intent of the city council to have remote public comment regularly included on the meeting agendas. However, as a reminder, the city council reserves the right to end or eliminate these public comment periods at any point if we deem that the system is being abused or is no longer suitable for um, allowing our meetings to be conducted efficiently and effectively. I will moderate the public comment period today, and uh, we will have a public comment period for this meeting uh, to last a total of 20 minutes. And each speaker is going to have two minutes to address the city council. Speakers are asked to, um, speakers are called upon in the order in which they registered to provide public comment on the council's website. Each speaker must call in from the phone number used for this registration and using the meeting phone number, ID, and passcode that was emailed to each speaker upon confirmation of their pre-registration. This is a different number than the general meeting listen line call-in information. So for those of you who are registered for public comment, take the time now to make sure that you are calling into the meeting phone number with the ID and passcode that was emailed to you upon confirmation of your registration using the same exact number that you pre-registered with. If you have called into the general meeting listen line, that is the wrong number and you will appear as not present on my end and I will not be able to call on you in order to hear public comment. For those um, individuals who do show up as not present on my end, I'll make sure to call your name out to make sure that you have uh, notice of the fact that you are uh, listed as not present so you can check your credentials once again. Again, I'll call on each speaker by name and in the order in which they registered on the council's website. If you've not yet registered to speak but would like to, you can sign up before the end of public comment by going to council's website at seattle.gov forward slash council. The public comment link is also listed on today's agenda. Once I call on a speaker's uh, name, staff will unmute the appropriate um, microphone and, an, and you will hear an automatic prompt if you have been unmuted. That'll be your cue to excuse me, um, press star six in order to um, unmute yourself. Again, in order to unmute yourself and for us to hear you, you will need to press star six after you hear the prompt of you have been unmuted. I'm gonna go ahead and call on the first two speakers for public comment today. The first two speakers are Howard Gale followed by Cody Zaleski. Howard, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, Howard Gale, District 7, commenting on continuing failure to have police accountability in Seattle. This Friday in four days, we commemorate the fourth anniversary of the SPD's brutal murder of, brutal murder of Charlena Lyles, who was pregnant, leaving her four children motherless. At a public meeting after this murder, Council Member Juarez said, quote, we will demand accountability, transparency, and community oversight, and not allow this to happen. Council President Gonzalez said, quote, I want you to hold us accountable. We can't wait any longer for these systems to be changed, unquote. And Council Member Herbold said that, quote, we are already shamed. What I am pledging to you is to work on finding a new way of doing things, 
so that we can actually get different results. I will use the power that I have on the city council to change what is happening today in our city, unquote. But then the following years brought us the brutal SVD killings of Iosea Falotogo, Danny Rodriguez, Ryan Smith, Sean McFur, Terry Caver, and Derek Hayden. Not only had nothing changed, but the families and loved ones of those killed by the SVD had to suffer, in addition to a brutal and unjust loss, a complete failure of accountability and justice because their loved ones were killed in Seattle where truly independent investigations have been and remain impossible. Seattle's police accountability system deemed all of these killings either lawful and proper or have not even completed or attempted an investigation into these killings. A recent NBC News report on officers have repeat, that who have repeatedly shot people focuses on one Seattle officer who shot four people, killing three, including the horrifying and completely avoidable murder of Ryan Smith in 2019. It is only through 100% civilian-led and run accountability that these past bad acts can be revealed, thereby preventing future ones. I invite everyone here to join Seattleites in a city initiative to finally create full civilian oversight of police by going to seattlestop.org. That is seattlestop.org. Thank you. Thank you so much for calling in today. Our next speaker is uh, Cody Zaleski, followed by Sage Wilson. Cody, welcome. Hi. Oh, hi. My name is Cody Zaleski, and I'm a resident of District 4. I'm here representing the organization Decriminalize Nature Seattle. Our group seeks to have entheogenic plant medicine be listed as the lowest law enforcement priority with protections for medical practitioners. I would first like to, to thank the seven Seattle City Council members for their signatures last week on the letter submitted by Council Members Lewis and Council Members Herbold. There is increasingly more recognition that the Schedule One designations of psychedelic entheogenic medicine is based in archaic misinformation. The examination and inclusion of these medic medicines in the OEIR task force is an extremely welcome change. We find that these entheogenic substances are incredibly valuable in the treatment of pathological rumination and psychiatric disorders. Not only do these medicines carry low to no risk of addiction and abuse, but are actually beneficial in treating the abuse of other substances such as alcohol and opiates. Based on preliminary evidence, these medicines even exceed the success rates of 12-step programs. In addition to their inclusion on the OER task force, we would ask the council to signal their support by taking the very modest step of making enforcement of drug laws related to antigens the lowest law enforcement priority as soon as possible. If the city of Seattle passes our measure, we would be the eighth city in the country to acknowledge the benefits of these substances and send a signal to state and federal lawmakers that people are ready for more comprehensive legal change. Thank you and I cede my time. Thank you so much for calling in today, Cody. Next up is Sage Wilson, followed by Raymond Evans. Sage, welcome. Hi, Sage Wilson here on behalf of Working Washington today to urge you to pass the contractor transparency ordinance today, including the intention by council to act this year to make the gig economy pay up. The COVID crisis has become a COVID bonanza for gig companies. Instacart alone added more than a half million new workers this past year. Gig companies have established new lines of business from prescription delivery to restaurant staffing, and dozens of executives have struck it rich. In fact, DoorDash's CEO was paid $400 million last year, one of the very highest pay packages on record. Meanwhile, the people doing the work are paid as little as $2 a job, and too many food delivery workers can't afford food themselves. City Council took bold and effective action last year to pass emergency hazard pay in six days for many gig workers, and these laws have made a tremendous difference. However, as we look to the possibility of these emergency laws expiring, it's time to take the next step and act to advance permanent policies that raise pay, protect flexibility, and provide meaningful transparency to all gig workers. The timeline for action in the ordinance before you today is an important step in that direction. And as we work with stakeholders to hammer out a policy that raises pay, protects flexibility, and provides transparency, we welcome the clear statement about Council's intention to end what is effectively a sub-minimum wage for people who rely on gig work including people of color, immigrant workers, workers with disabilities, LGBTQ workers, and other marginalized workers. I note also that Council is taking action today on a permanent policy to address some of the concerns raised by community restaurants about their dealings with gig companies. We appreciate Council as a multifaceted approach to reining in abuses by these multi-billion dollar corporations, and are glad to see Council is taking steps to address the needs of gig workers at the same time. Thank you again for your work on the transparency ordinance before you today. I look forward to it passing, including the language stating Council's intention to act this year to make the gig economy pay up. Thanks for calling in, Sage. Next up is Raymond Evans, followed by Kim Wolf. Raymond, welcome. Thank you, Council members. 
My name is Raymond Evans, and I represent gig workers here in the Seattle Puget Sound region. I worked at Nordstrom for 22 years as a personal stylist of a very high-end um, clientele that serves in multiple capacities. I'm a local native of Seattle and also feel that the city has always been a place that I can relate to. But as a black gay male who's gotten older and um, things have changed, the city is changing face, and I feel like we're leaving people behind and they're falling through the cracks. The gift work is a nice fallback. It allows people of color, black, brown, whatever color they may be, to have a way to obtain a life for themselves, come to a city that's a wonderful place, provide a life, pursue a life, and make ends meet for themselves. But when we're doing work as gig workers and large companies that are making billions of dollars of profit are expecting us as the person who's already gone through trauma and trying to make it and contribute to society to continue to rely on the, the graciousness of others who are also stressed, it, we fall through the cracks. People are making it 3 and $4 an hour. We're riding around in cars that we can't pay permits on. We can't pay the licensing fees. We can't pay the maintenance. And it's, imper it's, it's, it's imperative that the city council, um, I encourage the city council, to consider you know, voting on this bill today for the transparency so that we can better have a better understanding of what these corporations are really doing so that Seattle can continue to be a city which is based in values, diversity, multiculturalism, ethnic sensitivity, Black Lives do Matter. So I encourage you guys today to make that happen and thank you for your time. Thank you for calling in today. Next up is Kim Wolf, followed by Aaron Burkhalter. Kim, welcome. Thank you. I'm Kimberly Wolf. I'm a gig worker, and um, I'm supporting uh, the passage of CB 1269, mostly because of the transparency that's in there, which is the first step that we need in order to uh, know what exactly is happening and make sure that fair standards are are, are there for everyone. Um, also, the commitment in this bill to pass fair uh, labor standards or pay standards this year is the thing that I'm most uh, excited about. And um, I really hope that you guys get this passed today. I can see the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, for calling in. Next up is Aaron Burkhalter, followed by Michelle Thomas. Aaron, welcome. Hi, I'm Aaron Burkhalter. I am a project manager with the LEAD programs in the southwest area of King County, which includes the Southwest Precinct that opened operations in December. I'm here to talk about funding LEAD to bridge a gap to meet the needs uh, of our community. In the Southwest Precinct, we have a great relationship working with area organizations, residents, and business owners, the latter of which are particularly excited about LEADs arriving to West Seattle and ask me all the time, what can we do to help? And they are also asking in what ways we might be able to help them. With a $3 million uh, funding gap, we are asking businesses and residents with, for their patience, even though we have an important group who can help us prevent people from landing in the criminal justice system. Filling the gap will not only provide us uh, with resources in terms of case management we need for the program to be successful, but it will allow our community as well to participate in a program that prevents harm to the clients that we serve and impacts to the surrounding area. Thank you very much. Thank you for ca calling in, Erin. Next up is Michelle Thomas, followed by Mariah Mitchell. Michelle, welcome. Hi, I'm Michelle Thomas with the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, testifying with strong support for the transparency ordinance before you today, including the commitment to take action to enact a minimum compensation policy for gig workers this year. The city and state have taken important steps to expand tenant protections and address our affordable housing crisis, but we have to do more, including by raising pay for gig workers who are some of the lowest paid workers in our city. According to the latest out of reach report from the National Low Income Housing Coalition, Workers need a job paying more than $40 an hour to afford a two-bedroom apartment in King County. But tens of thousands of jobs via apps like Instacart and DoorDash pay as little as $2 a job, far less than minimum wage. This is directly related to housing justice and the current eviction crisis. Economic security is housing security. When people get paid a living wage, they can afford to pay the rent. This is also about racial justice and creating an equitable recovery from the pandemic. BIPOC workers are highly represented as both gig workers and as renters. BIPOC renters disproportionately face housing insecurity and eviction. Ensuring fair 
and decent wages for gig workers is critical for racial justice and housing stability. I urge you to pass the transparency ordinance today with the commitment to take action this year to end the subminimum wage for gig workers. Thank you. Thank you so much for calling in, Michelle. Next up is Mariah Mitchell, followed by Jason Reeves. Go ahead, Mariah. Mariah, I see that you are unmuted on my end, but we cannot hear you. So check to see if you're muted on your phone. Okay, I am. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, so my name is Mariah Mitchell, and I am calling in for the transparency today. Um, I would like to say that I am a family member of Charlena Lyles, and I also grew up by the North uh, Precinct, and um, I am very familiar with the racism that comes out of that precinct. Um, but the reason I am calling today is with Working Washington, and I'm calling on the transparency on CB120069. I'm a single mom of three, and this last year I've had to make the hard choices of whether to stay at home to help my children with schoolwork or bring us an income. My eldest child would likely stay at home in order for to help the family out so that I could work as an Uber Eats driver instead of being able to attend her own activities. And the companies I have worked for boast the ability to make a flexible schedule for ourselves yet penalize us when daily life happens. Establishing labor standards for gig workers would ensure transparency, continued flexibility, access to stability, and overall enrichment of our lives. It would also set equity standards for all so that nobody is getting paid less than minimum wage. When I first started working, the pay was great. I could do this. They cut our pay time and time again, currently without the hazard pay. The pay is substandard and you can't live off of two dollars. Along with that, they have done unfair background checks and also have um, deactivated us without giving us a reason. You must create labor standards with full transparency for all gig workers. Thank you, I cede my time. Thank you for calling in, Mariah. Next up is Jason Reeves, followed by Daniel Aruz. And Daniel, if you are listening, you are showing up as not present on my end, so I won't be able to call on you um, until you show up as present. So double check those uh, numbers that you're using to call in. Um, otherwise, we're going to hear from Jason Reeves, followed by Tiara Dearborn. Jason, welcome. Thank you for having me. This actually marks my second year coming to the city council. And I, again, am also with Working Washington, and I've been coming here for two years asking for work for uh, city council to back us up with uh, minimum wage standards and uh, transparency and help us uh, truly keep making uh, money out there. Like M Mariah said, we've seen pay cut after pay cut after pay cut while uh, their their revenues and their other stock uh, prices and whatnot go up and up and up. And it's all because of us. We're out there making we're out there making work happen. Um, we need you guys to back us up because it's obviously, as we've seen with Prop 22, when they have the when they have the chance to make laws themselves, they make them themselves, and they make it uh, they make it at the expense of the worker, uh, who is actually the best resource. Seattleites, we can do better. Uh, I've been asking for the last two years. Come on, let's get this right. Let's do it now. Pass uh, minimum wage standards. The transparency is a step in the right direction, but we need to keep going. And a happy two year anniversary. I see the rest of my time. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for calling in today. Next up is Tiara Dearborn. And I am also showing that William William Cerrone is showing as not present on my end. So again, William, if you're listening, make sure you um, double check those credentials that you called into the meeting for. And I, if you show up as present, I will give you your two minutes. Tiara. Welcome. Hi, my name is Tiara Dearborn, and I'm a project manager for LEAD in Seattle. I'm here to provide thanks to the council for today's proposed amendment of Council Bill 120096 that will fill LEAD's 2021 budget deficit. 
This will mean that we can continue to provide desperately needed wraparound case management services for individuals most traditionally impacted by the criminal legal system. That will work to actually address the underlying needs contributing to this behavior. This means that we can continue employing our case management team, including BIPOC individuals and individuals with lived experience who have dedicated their careers to doing this incredibly difficult and rewarding work. We can continue responding to community members and stakeholders' requests for a response that is not traditional enforcement to address low-level public order concerns. Thank you. Thank you for calling in today, Tara. Okay, I'm gonna double check my spreadsheet here to see if any of the individuals who are pre-registered and showed up as not present are now present. And I am still seeing Daniel and William showing up as not present on my end. So IT, can you confirm that we don't have anyone else in the waiting room um, that is pre-registered and, and for public comment? There are no other public comment registrants. Thank you so much, Sun. Appreciate it. So with that, we're going to close out the period of public comment and um, uh, begin on other items of business on the agenda. First up is payment of the bills. Will the clerk please read the title? Council Bill 120097, appropriate amount to pay started claims for the week of May 31st, 2021 through June 4th, 2021 and ordering the payment thereof. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I move to pass Council Bill 120097. Is there a second? Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that the bill pass. Are there any comments? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll on the passage of the bill? Lewis? Yes. Morales? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sawant? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Herbold? Yes. Juarez? Aye. Council President Gonzalez? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. The bill passes and the chair will sign it. Will the clerk please affix my signature to the legislation on my behalf? Will the clerk please read item one into the record? Agenda item one, Council Bill 120096, relating to appropriations for the Human Services Department, amending Ordinance 126237, which adopted the 2021 budget, modifying a proviso imposing by Ordinance 126298, and ratifying confirming certain prior acts. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I move to pass Council Bill 120096. Is there a second? Second. Thank you so much. Councilmember Lewis, you are the prime sponsor of this bill, so I'm going to hand it over to you to address this item. Uh, thank you so much, Madam President. Uh, and I, I want to thank the folks that called in uh, in support of this bill, uh, uh, particularly um, Jared uh, Dearborn, who just called in, who uh, really has been out in the field doing incredible work uh, in moving our neighbors experiencing homelessness into um, well-resourced and supported hotel-based shelters. Uh, that have been making a difference uh, for the folks who are receiving that kind of shelter and care, as well as the house residents and business owners of those neighborhoods uh, who have had um, problematic experiences with some um, of the unsanctioned encampments. Uh, this legislation gets us one step closer to continuing to hold up those folks who are doing this work by giving them the resources they need to get it done uh, and to, to accomplish a lot of uh, resolutions in these complicated areas uh, to the benefit of all parties and really making sure that we're centering that fundamentally we all have the same interest and that's really the core I think of the just care model and why it has been so successful is really uh, leveling that you know someone experiencing homelessness and unsanctioned encampment business owners and residents that have concerns about the encampment ultimately all have the same interest at heart, which is actually being able to uh, move folks inside to get the care and assistance they need. And this is the model that we are uh, essentially committing to front loading more resource toward uh, in the run up here to uh, the reopening of Seattle's economy uh, and the reality that during uh, COVID, as we've seen in countless news stories, the resources to provide health care, to provide shelter, to provide care to our most homeless, uh, to our homeless neighbors have been the most impacted to a large extent um, by the reality um, of the uh, COVID emergency. And that rebuilding and building back after COVID is going to require filling a lot of these service gaps 
uh, which means leaning into models uh, like the Just Care model. Um, I want to thank the Downtown Seattle Association for their very strong support of this measure and the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce, in addition to the service providers who are um, that who have been uh, doing this work, uh, particularly the Defender Association, uh, obviously um, REACH, Chief Seattle Club, uh, Asian Counseling Referral Service, among others. And, uh, you know, I hope that we can uh, get the support out the door to continue to build on the progress that we've been making together and have that impact be felt in more parts of the city instead of just in the Chinatown ID uh, and uh, Pioneer Square neighborhoods. So uh, with that, I will um, uh, turn it over because I think there's some amendments that need to be considered as well and uh, appreciate the opportunity to do this up. Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Lewis, for addressing the base bill. There are, um, there is at least one amendment that I'm aware of, so we will go ahead and address that amendment. And then um, <clears throat> once we've addressed the amendment, we can open up uh, the debate and discussion to the bill um, as amended. So I'm going to um, recognize Councilmember Herbold, who has amendment one, in order to have her make her motion. Thank you so much. I move to amend Council Bill 120096 as presented as Amendment 1 on the agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the bill be amended as presented on Amendment 1. Councilmember Merkerbold, I'm going to hand it back to you as the prime sponsor so that you can uh, walk us through the amendment. Thank you so much. As I mentioned at this morning's briefing, this amendment provides 3 million of the 12 million to expand the city's contract with LEAD. This expanded contract will allow LEAD to respond to the increase in community referrals as a result of COVID and the increased costs of operating during the pandemic. The expanded contract is consistent with council's vote last year to require lead to accept community referrals without prior law enforcement approval and council's adoption of resolution 31916 in 2019, which declares the city's commitment to ensuring that law enforcement pre arrest diversion programs receive public funding sufficient to accept all priority qualifying referrals citywide. Why is the uh, removal of the barrier um, to referrals requiring uh, prior law enforcement approval relevant to this amendment? It's so important because our community stakeholders want to use LEAD. We've gotten rid of the barrier that limited non-law enforcement referrals. Now we need to address the capacity limitations. Otherwise, LEAD will not be able to take direct referrals from as many neighborhood groups, neighborhood watches, precinct advisory councils, and business improvement areas that are interested in using LEAD. So I wanna um, thank Councilmember Lewis and Councilmember Morales for their co-sponsorship of this amendment and um, urge its support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Herbold. Uh, Councilmember Morales, you have your hand raised. Should we vote on this first or can I just address the amendment? What's that? So do you want to vote on the amendment first or can I, is this the time for me to address it? No, now, now would be the time to address um, and make any comments related to the amendment. Thank you. Um, well, first I do want to thank uh, council member Herbold for allowing me to co-sponsor this. She kind of beat me to the punch on actually drafting this amendment. Um, there's so much interest in this you know, sponsoring this because we know that LEAD works. Um, it is providing the, the organization, the, the effort is providing consistent, valuable diversion services. Um, you know, the LEAD program partners with organizations who know our communities and understand um, the different points of view that our neighbors um, feel about how to best address the, the um, challenges of our homeless neighbors. Um, but they are also trauma informed and they are trusted by um, by community members, by our unhoused neighbors, by business owners. Um, so it's really important, as Councilmember Herbold said, that we um, increase the capacity of this group 
to respond and provide the kind of service that we need. Constituents in my community are regularly asking how we can expand LEAD in places like Mount Baker and Beacon Hill. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, be able to co-sponsor this amendment and look forward to our ability as a city to make the kind of investments we need to really begin addressing um, uh, the challenges that our homeless neighbors are facing. Thank you so much, Councilmember uh, Morales, for those comments. Any additional? I see that Councilmember Peterson also has his hand raised. Uh, I'm assuming he wants to make a comment on Amendment One. So, Councilmember Peterson, please. Thank you, Council President. Uh, I strongly support the lead diversion program, and will continue to fund lead. I would rather see 100% of these housing funds go toward housing people experiencing homelessness. So, I'll be voting no on this amendment which would redirect, essentially redirect 25% of the, of the $12 million. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Peterson. Any other comments or questions on Amendment 1? I don't see any other hands raised. So with that being said, will the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of Amendment 1? Lewis? Aye. Morales? Yes. Peterson? No. Sawant? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Herbold? Yes. Juarez? Aye. Council President Gonzalez? Aye. Seven in favor, one opposed. Thank you so much. The motion carries. The amendment is adopted and the amended bill is now before the council. Are there any uh, additional comments on the amended bill. Councilmember Morales, please. Thank you. Um, I am really excited to see this um, bill. So I do want to thank um, Councilmember Lewis. My office consistently hears resounding support for Just Care. In fact, Just Care is the model that my office looked to last year when we fought to eliminate the navigation team and replace it with the HOPE program. Um, I will admit there's still some work to do to make sure that the HOPE program is implemented as intended, but Just Care has proven to be successful at sheltering people in safe, non-congregate settings, uh, at providing intensive 24-7 case management, and in finding people long-term stable housing they are not perpetuating trauma to unhoused people. Um, and we know that to truly meet each individual's needs, um, we need this kind of service, this kind of option for folks. Um, that's why my constituents are regularly um, asking for programs like this to be extended. That support comes because people are seeing rapid results and they're seeing real results. Um, whether we're talking about small business owners having fewer encounters with folks who are experiencing a crisis or service providers who are seeing a real collaboration um, pay off. We know that house neighbors are seeing folks committing crimes of poverty or crimes related to a state of distress, getting the kind of help that they need. And we see unhoused folks able to get into a safe space, receive intensive services that meet their needs and find housing. So small business owners, business associations, service providers, house neighbors, the King County Council, the majority of the city council, and most importantly, our unhoused neighbors themselves have all applauded the work of Just Care. I was recently in a um, public safety meeting in the CID where a representative from SPD said that they too welcome the work that Just Care does. So I don't know who, who isn't on board at this point, but I think this is really important work that goes beyond traditional outreach this is public safety work that doesn't involve the police. It's substance abuse treatment work. It's crisis intervention work. And it's housing connection and support work. Um, there's a real appetite for us to do something on all of these fronts. That is a big part of the conversation we've been having in the last year in Seattle. I've heard it over and over again that folks want this work done without police intervention and without punitive consequences that move people from one place to the other but don't actually accomplish anything. People understand that that doesn't work. Um, and showing up with a truck, a bulldozer or a dump truck isn't humane. Um, so this is an option that really provides a model of care that 
um, has acute impacts for our community with minimal funds and support from the city. We've been able, they've been able to create a system that really has huge support across the city. So I'm excited by the funds that we've appropriated and excited to see this work continue. And I'll just close by thanking both LEAD and Just Care for the work they've done in my district um, and thanking Councilmember Lewis once again for highlighting the needs of these programs and council colleagues who have co-sponsored this. I think it's our strong advocacy um, that is contributing to this work and I look forward to having a strong partner um, in the executive's office so that we can distribute funds allocated for just care in the future. And as we all know, um, we can appropriate these funds, but we need to get the money to the providers. And my hope is that we'll be able to do that um, once we get this signed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Morales. Really appreciate those comments. Uh, Councilmember Strauss. Uh, thank you, Council President, and thank you, colleagues, for and the sponsors of this bill for bringing it forward. I'm excited to vote yes today and uh, had hoped to see this bill sooner, uh, and I'm glad to see it here today because we know that Just Care works. It has been a proven solution to address homelessness with lasting results rather than um, uh, time-limited results. This is a program that we need throughout the city, and I'm excited to see how we and how quickly we can expand these services because we need these services. We need the Just Care program in Green Lake and Fremont and Ballard and throughout the city. Thank you to everyone who's made it a success so far. And I look forward to continuing to work with everyone on bringing Just Care throughout the city. Thank you, Council President. Thanks so much, Council Member Strauss. Um, Council Member Lewis, I see that you have your hand raised. You're the prime sponsor, so you'll get last word. Um, so let me let me see if um, anyone else has any comments. Councilmember Peterson, please. Thank you, Council President. I had a question about the, uh, based on some comments I just heard, I have a question for the sponsor about the bill, and then I have quick comments, just a few sentences. Um, the question, I, we talk about just care. I just want to make sure what we're talking about is the model and not a particular uh, vendor or provider. Is that is that correct? Uh, well, that uh, that could be one way that it could be interpreted um, because the, I mean, we can't be too too prescriptive. Um, I mean, the bill is not does not um, pick a particular vendor, right? Okay. Um, so, uh, Thank you. not necessarily, but the people that have been bidding on this work have been the same consortium of providers so I, I would anticipate that it, it would probably end up being the consortium that the defender association has convened but it, it would it doesn't necessarily have to be thank you um, council president just quick comments to close out sure. my thoughts Please. thank you uh, i'll be voting yes on this ordinance uh, i recognize the urgent need to house people experiencing homelessness Placing them in hotels and other non-congregate shelter during the COVID pandemic is, is, is a promising, albeit temporary, solution during the current crisis. And so I'm supporting this investment of public dollars to make sure the investment of these public dollars is ultimately effective, regardless of which service providers receive the funds to manage the program. Since this is not a sole source award, I would ask our Human Services Department to track the key metrics such as the cost to house each person and the key outcomes, such as the number of people exiting to permanent housing. I'll be voting yes on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Peterson. Any additional comments before we close out debate? I'm not seeing any other hands raised. I also wanted to um, uh, echo thanks to Councilmember Lewis for leading the charge as the chair of our um, homelessness uh, committee, really appreciate the leadership in this space and the opportunity to collaborate with you, Councilmember Lewis, as one of the, the sponsors of this really important piece of legislation. Um, we know that the, the model related to uh, meeting the needs of people experiencing homelessness that allows us to be nimble and uh, not pursue um, you know, sort of strategies that are law enforcement focused first are really critical to our ability to successfully um, 
uh, end homelessness. And um, while this is a temporary solution, it's still a very important one to begin to connect people to the services and the housing that they need. So I'm really excited about the opportunity to continue to invest in a um, model that that really uh, seems to have a, a broad community support amongst constituencies that don't ordinarily agree with each other. Um, and, and I think that, it, it, that the results that we are seeing from housing placements and service connection uh, it, are very promising results. And, and, um, and I'm excited to be able to continue to support investments, strategic investments in this area to continue to uh, make a meaningful difference in the area of um, homelessness. And with that being said, I am going to hand it over to Council Member Lewis, who's gonna close out debate, and then we're gonna vote on this on this bill. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief here in closing it out, uh, given everyone else's comments. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've said a couple of times that, uh, you know, my predecessor, Sally Bagshaw, used to refer to things as passing the C-test, or that the C-test is an important component of what we do, like people that can see the tangible difference that something that we fund is having, uh, and then draw conclusions about, um, uh, you know, whether that is, is making a difference in their lives or not. And, uh, you know, unequivocally, this Just Care consortium during the pandemic has passed the C-test. I, I received more positive communication from, uh, from provider advocates, from small business owners, from uh, neighborhood residents uh, who are involved in this and who have really changed some of their core convi convictions and perceptions about how to solve the homelessness crisis through their experience of working with and interacting with Just Care uh, and seeing how this approach and this model can work. Uh, I, I just wanted to add a couple more sort of um, logistical things at the top. Uh, there are many ways that this investment can uh, be squared with our ultimate budget. I know that this has been um, a little bit of a um, uh, of a hiccup in funding this effort over the past of the over the course of the past few months, um, based on interpretations of FEMA guidance uh, and based on uh, um, schedules of potential reimbursement for some of these dollars. Uh, we have new information now that we didn't have uh, when we initially passed this legislation. We know that the general fund is recovering at a faster rate than we had initially anticipated when we did our last budget. We have the benefit of a $10 million FEMA reimbursement insurance program that State Representative Macri passed in the last legislative session. Uh, we have the benefit um, of uh, knowing that there's going to be another big tranche of federal money coming down the pipeline in 2022 uh, that gives us some extra flexibility. Um, it, even uh, since crafting this bill, we also have a little bit more assurance that uh, Jumpstart is going to survive its legal challenges and be part of the fabric of our city budget. Um, there are ways we can square this obligation of $12 million dollars that can be spent up front at the beginning of the summer to make a noticeable difference and impact, both for people experiencing homelessness and people who have concerns about the unsanctioned encampments. There are multiple ways we can remit this money. The legislation allows, if there's capacity issues, for this money to be remitted uh, through the contracts that King County has, um, you know, that would still be subject to the same reporting requirements, but to take advantage of our relationship and partnership with King County to remit those dollars faster to get them out into the community. Um, from my conversations with our counterparts at King County, um, that arrangement would be possible if it's something the city needs to pursue to avoid uh, um, administrative hurdles with our uh, you know, greatly appreciated and considerably overworked human services department contractors. Uh, King County stands ready to be a strong partner and I look forward to uh, helping to uh, establish that relationship if necessary to get this resource out into the community. Um, I do want to just finally thank the coalition that Council Member Gonzalez alluded to earlier. Um, this effort has led to a letter that is now out in the world in the public record where the Chamber of Commerce and the Downtown Seattle Association are praising Council Member Swant for her leadership. So it is clear uh, we can do great things when great ideas come forward uh, that um, can transcend some of the divides we have in the city. Uh, and I want to thank um, the, the coalition that includes the Downtown Seattle Association and the 
uh, Seattle Chamber of Commerce, in addition to organizations representing arts, organizations representing tourism, and service providers who have been uh, clamoring for this kind of investment for a long time. So with that, uh, you know, I think there will still be some additional work on the other side of passing this bill um, to hammer out some of the details and implementation. I look forward to those conversations uh, and I'm uh, um, looking forward to voting on this. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis. Thanks again for stewarding uh, this bill through the legislative process. All right, colleagues, but that debate is now closed. Will the clerk please call the roll on the passage of the amended bill? Lewis? Yes. Morales? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sawant? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Perbold? Yes. Juarez? Aye. Council President Gonzalez? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. The bill passes as amended and the chair will sign it. Will the clerk please affix my signature to the legislation on my behalf? Will the clerk please read items two through six into the record? Agenda items two through six, appointments 1940 through 1944. Appointment of Mary G. Wu as member of Seattle Chinatown International District Preservation and Developing Development Authority Governing Council for term to December 31st, 2022. Appointments and reappointments of Cindy Ju, Lisa Nitsi, David J. Della, and Wayne H. Lau as member of Seattle Chinatown International District Preservation and Development Authority Governing Council for term to December 31st, 2023. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I move to confirm appointments 1940 through 1944. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to confirm the appointments. Councilmember Strauss, you are the sponsor of these appointments. I'm going to hand it over to you to walk us through these items. Uh, thank you, Council President, and thank you, Clerk uh, Sanchez. You summed it up very well. These are five appointments to the Seattle Chinatown International District Preservation and Development Authority Governing Council. Uh, Skipta. Is, is the shorthand name for it, is a community-driven organization that works in the CID to develop affordable housing, manage affordable housing and commercial property, and engage in community and economic development. Uh, these five, I'll, I'll summarize these five people now. Mei Wu is the Internal Controls and Change Management Director for Holland America and grew up in the West Kong building in the CID. Cindy Ju is a recent graduate of the Harvard Business School and works as a real estate professional at Heinz, focused on acquisition and development. And with Lisa Nitza is the Vice President of Marketing, Investment, and Community Partnerships for Nitza Stegen, and is a previous CEO of Social Venture Partners Seattle. David Della is a former Seattle City Council member and former Deputy Chief of, uh, Chief of Staff to Mayor Norm Rice, among other notable titles he has held over 20 years in the public sector. I'm excited to be bringing him forward. He is being reappointed to the board. And Wayne Lau has been uh, has a 35 year career in commercial real estate lending and small business lending, including founding as the founding executive of a local community commercial bank. He is also being reappointed to the board. Council President, that is the summary of these five appointments and I urge a yay vote on all of them. Thank you so much, Councilmember Strauss. Are there any additional comments on these appointments? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on the confirmation of appointments 1940 through 1944? Lewis? Yes. Morales? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sawant? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Herbold? Yes. Juarez? Yes. Council President Gonzalez? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. The motion carries and the appointments are confirmed. Will the clerk please read item seven into the record? Agenda item seven, clerk file 314476, findings, conclusions, and decision of the City Council of the City of Seattle and the matter of the final assessment role for local improvement district number 6751 and the appeals of multiple appellants. Thank you so much. I move the adoption of the findings, conclusions, and decision of the council as presented in clerk file 314476. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the findings, conclusions, and decision of the council. I'm going to hand it over to Councilmember Juarez, who's the sponsor of this um, item, this clerk file, and uh, looking forward to being walked through this particular <laughs> item. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, Council President and colleagues, we have items seven, eight, and nine that all have to do with the lid. So um, Council President, I guess I'll just do them each individual as we call them in. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. and if, if your comments are divided up in a way where we can do that, that'd be great. Otherwise I can have the clerk read uh, um, the next two items into the record if, if you planned on addressing them all at once. Can we do that? Would you mind? Sure. Madam Clerk, can you also please read item eight and nine into the record? The short titles are fine. Thank you. The report of the Public Assets and Native Communities Committee, agenda item eight, modifying, approving, and confirming the final assessments and assessment role of local improvement district number 6751. The committee recommends that the bill pass. And agenda item nine, council bill 120073 relating to financing public improvements within local improvement district number 6751, authorizing providing for the issuance and sale of local improvement district bonds. The committee recommends that the bill pass. Great, we will take an individual vote on each of these items, but for purposes of the discussion, uh, Councilmember Juarez, you may now um, address all three items as part of your comments related to this subject matter. Take it away. Thank you. Um, so council, uh, council colleagues and president, as you know, we've been working on the lid for a while. So I'm just going to go ahead and briefly touch on items seven, eight, and nine, starting with, of course, um, agenda item seven, and that is the clerk file, the findings, conclusions, and decisions. And this document is the written record on the matter of the waterfront lid 6751. The council's adoption of the findings and conclusions decision would approve the final assessment role for the local improvement district <clears throat> with revisions recommended by the hearing examiner, um, which also denied each of the appeals and confirmed the hearing examiner's recommendation for each. The um, What I should say that is also in the clerk's file is all of the appeals, the hearing examiner's decision, the initial report, the final report, and also um, a chronology dating back to 2000, November 2000 and 11 i believe so the whole history is there so we made sure that that was in the clerk file for everybody's reading and recommendation and which all of our colleagues got as well as the public and we had a hearing on that the second item uh, item number eight council bill 120072 approves the final assessment role again this would establish the final assessment role for the construction of the improvements of the lid numbering 6751 it's the number of the lid and the third is the bill that authorizes the city it's the financing piece to issue bonds to pay the cost for the improvements to the waterfront lid so council president uh these all came out of committee unanimously and so uh, i as the chair uh would ask that the um city council adopt the clerk file uh, item number seven which is clerk file three one four four seven six agenda item number eight that i asked the committee or the full council to pass council bill 120072 and i ask that full council um, pass council bill 120073 thank you council president thank, thank you so much councilmember wars and thanks for um addressing all three items at once it can make it much more efficient so okay. colleagues um any additional comments on any three of these items so we're talking about items seven eight and nine related to the lid councilmember lewis please Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just want to take a moment to uh, really thank Chair Juarez for uh, her um, transparency and accessibility throughout the process in her committee. Um, I am not a member of the relevant committee, but certainly this is an area of intense interest um, in District 7, and I really appreciated the opportunity to be able to um, drop by uh, the committee, uh, be able to ask questions of central staff and, uh, and other relevant um, analysts on these uh, various bills um, and uh, get clarification on things that I was unclear about. Um, just speaking generally uh, to the entire um, waterfront lid project, which you know I'm free to do here in this open session and in this context, um, I did just want to share uh, you know some of the takeaways from that hearing and from the questions uh that were asked uh, you know i do think fundamentally it is appropriate um to seek 
the use of local improvement districts for significant uh, um, for significant infrastructure changes uh, that are going to have the benefit uh, of the entire neighborhood as a whole um, at heart. Uh, and we know that there's going to be considerable improvement uh, to the core of downtown, to the waterfront, uh, and to the area around the, the Pike Place Market uh, from some of the investments that are going to be paid for partially through this lid. Um, I do want to say, uh, you know, I, I, I know that there are cases out there of folks who are going to get um, uh, caught in um, the boundaries of the local improvement district where payment could be a hardship uh, and that the residential portion of the lid as a whole um, is, a, is a fairly small portion. This was um, useful information from the hearing uh, that I attended that it's about 20% of the $174 million. Um, just to remind the general public, the, the lid um, is assessed to pay for about 49% of the improvements um, involved in this project um, 51% of the improvements to be paid for with other taxes and with private philanthropy. Uh, but I, I think it is important to flag that the residential portion of the lid is, is a fairly modest part of the overall project. Um, I would certainly be interested in pursuing in the future, especially as we go through implementation and assessment, um, that if there, if there are people reporting significant hardship um, over the course of the period where people are expected to pay into the lid, um, the, the council explore some kind of mitigation for the residential portion um, of the lid uh, folks that are assessed um, based on a hardship to pay uh, um, or based on, on other ex, uh, extenuating circumstances. Um, but uh, that said, having reviewed the clerk file and having reviewed the rest of the process that the hearing examiner and uh, that the relevant committee and, and indeed a lot of the outreach work that has gone into the overall waterfront project, I, I cannot say sitting here in the in a quasi judicial capacity um, that this that this lid uh, has um, uh, or I have to agree that this lid has been conducted in a way uh, that is um, uh, squaring the law and the um, rules around how a lid assessment is carried out and implemented. Um, for those reasons, I'm going to vote today um, on all three pieces of legislation to move forward on this project. Um, but I do want to flag that uh, going forward, the, the residential portion of the lid is something I would be interested in um, exploring future ways to mitigate over the pendency of the assessments um, in cases where there, there is uh, real hardship, um, particularly for people that earn fixed incomes. Um, with that, I, I don't have any other uh, comments, uh, Madam President. I do just want to uh, once more um, uh, express my appreciation to the chair for uh, for being very accessible throughout this process and allowing ample opportunity uh, for me to engage. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis. Any um, any other comments on the bill? All right, Councilmember Juarez. Any closing remarks before we close out debate? Yes, I want to thank Councilmember Lewis. I'm glad you had an opportunity to read the clerk file and that the law aligns itself with the state law. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, this lid, the number 6751 means that we've had 6,751 lids since the turning of the century, which aligns us with state law. So that's great. I'm glad you had a chance to look at that and that you approve. So with that, Council President, I'd like us to take a vote on that. Thank you so much, Councilmember Juarez. Thanks for closing out debate. Hearing no additional comments, will the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of the findings, conclusions, and decision of the council as presented in clerk file 314476. Lewis? Aye. Morales? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Swant? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Herbold? Yes. Juarez? Yes. Council President Gonzalez? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. The motion carries and the findings, conclusions, and decision of the council as presented in clerk file 314476 is adopted. Will the clerk please affix my signature to the findings, conclusions, and decision of the city council on my behalf. We have already read items eight and nine into the record and had debate. So I'm just gonna call each of these items up individually for vote at this time. Will the clerk please call the roll on the passage of item 
8, which is, hold on a minute, I'm scrolling here, Council Bill 120072. Lewis? Yes. Morales? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Swant? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Herbold? Yes. Juarez? Yes. Council President Gonzalez? Yes. Eight in favor, none opposed. The bill passes and the chair will sign it. Will the clerk please affix my signature to the legislation on my behalf? Okay, moving over to item nine, which again has already been read into the record, described and debated. So I'm gonna go ahead and just call this one up for a vote now. So will the clerk please call the roll on the passage of council bill 120073, which is item nine. Lewis. Yes. Morales. Yes. Peterson. Yes. Swant. Yes. Strauss. Yes. Herbold. Yes. Juarez. Yes. Council President Gonzalez. Yes. Eight in favor, none opposed. The bill passes and the chair will sign it. Will the clerk please affix my signature to the legislation on my behalf? Will the clerk please read item 10 into the record? Agenda item 10, Council Bill 120051, relating to public assets, land use, and zoning establishing regulations for the center campus sub area within the sign overlay district for the Seattle Center, amending section 23.55.054 of and adding a new section 23.55.062, the Seattle Municipal Code. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Juarez, back to you to address this particular item. Thank you, Council President. So this bill would allow for the implementation of Seattle Center's signage improvement project that we've been working on for a few years, as well as, 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 well as its long-term vision for campus signage described in the Century 21 Master Plan, for those of us that have had the opportunity to read that lovely document. The proposed legislation would amend the Land Use Code, and uh, I think that's Title 23, to establish regulations for the center campus sub area of the Seattle Center Sign Overlay District. So the Public Assets and Native Communities Committee held a public hearing and briefing and vote on June 4th, passed unanimously. And so today I'm asking that full council pass this bill. Thank you, Thank you so much, Councilmember Juarez. Are there any additional comments on the bill? I don't see any hands raised. Double check in here, no hands raised, okay. Uh, with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and close out debate and that's comes more wires. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Nope. Oh, okay, got it. Will the clerk please call the roll on the passage of the bill? Lewis. Yes. Morales. Yes. Peterson. Yes. Swant. Yes. Strauss. Yes. Herbold. Yes. Juarez? Yes. Council President Gonzalez? Yes. Eight in favor, none opposed. The bill passes and the chair will sign it. Will the clerk please affix my signature to the legislation on my behalf? Will the clerk please read item 11 into the record? Agenda item 11, Council Bill 120032, relating to Whitman Park, transferring jurisdiction of a portion of Whitman Avenue North from the Seattle Department of Transportation to Seattle Parks and Recreation for open space, park, and recreation purposes. The committee recommends that the bill pass as amended. Thank you so much, Councilmember Juarez. This one is also an item from your committee, so I'm going to hand it back over to you. Thank you, Council President. Yes, this has to do with parks and SDOT. It's basically a land swap. So this allows for a land swap from Seattle Parks and Recreation to the Seattle Department of Transportation. It would, would transfer three feet of land from the Seattle Parks along East Green Lake Way between Northeast 50th Street to Northeast 57th Street to SDOT, which is Seattle Department of Transportation, which it was inadvertently included as park property. So. We want to write that wrong. The legislation clarifies that the land is the property of SDOT. You will also see in your materials the bill passed committee as amended to substitute two technical corrections to the base legislation. It passed unanimously, and I'm asking that full council pass this bill as amended. Thank you so much, Councilmember Wars. Are there any additional comments? 
Councilmember Strauss, please. Uh, thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilmember Juarez, for bringing this forward. This is a highly technical piece of legislation that is required. The Parks Department and SDOT work together in great partnership uh, around many uh, of the aspects of the paving project around Green Lake Way. Uh, this is one of those small details that needs to be ironed out. I'll use this moment to again make my pitch to the Seattle Department of Transportation and the Parks Department to do something similar along West Green Lake Way North where we need to have a two-way bike lane and a two-way traveling street for cars. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council Member Juarez. Great. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Council Member Juarez, any uh, closing remarks? Uh, thank you, Council Member Strauss, for making a pitch for a bike lane. Appreciate that. So anyway, no, that's it, Council President. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, we're, uh, debate is closed down on this bill now. Will the clerk please call the roll on the passage of the bill? Lewis? Yes. Morales? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sawant? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Herbold? Yes. Juarez? Aye. Council President Gonzalez? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. The bill passes and the chair will sign it. Will the clerk please affix my signature to the legislation on my behalf? Okay, will the clerk please read item 12 into the record? Agenda item 12, Council Bill 120069, relating to independent contractors in Seattle, establishing labor standards requirements for independent contractors working in Seattle. The committee recommends the bill pass as amended. Thank you so much. Uh, colleagues, as we all know, Councilmember Mosqueda is excused from today's full city council meeting. So in her stead on item uh, 12 will be Councilmember Herbold, who is going to provide the committee report. Councilmember Herbold, please. Thank you so much. So in Councilmember um, Mosqueda's Stead, I'm reporting out uh, this bill from the Finance and Housing Committee for your consideration. As it happens, the bill is sponsored by me. Um, this is Council Bill 120069. The committee unanimously recommended passage of the bill as amended with a vote of 5-0. If the chair permits, I will now move to address the bill as the sponsor. Please do. Thank you so much. But as mentioned this morning in Council things, we um, uh, addressed many of the concerns of stakeholders and the Office of Labor Standards through a substitute bill and an amendment uh, that were both adopted uh, in committee. Just moving backwards a little bit for some context first before I get into the, the details of that um, substitute bill and amendment. Um, misclassification is um, a high priority um, of, of our um, of our labor standards um, uh, advocates, myself included, back in February 2019, uh, after working with the Office of Labor Standards, the council passed resolution 31863. In part, that resolution requested that the Labor Standards Advisory Council work with the Office of Labor Standards on the issue of misclassification and provide input on effective strategies based on their experience in existing worker and business associations. In May 2020, the council received final recommendations from LSAC. Um, however, due to the pandemic, we were not able to take up recommendations until early this year when my staff and council central staff presented um, to LSAC on, on, um, on the plans to, um, to take up their, uh, their recommendations. Again, that, um, that policy deliberation um, began, um, I, I believe, was back in, in, in February. The Finance and Housing Committee proceeded to have several committee discussions on the legislation, um, which led to additional conversations and other stakeholders. Finally, on June 4th, the committee adopted a substitute bill to address the, stand, the concerns um, that we've heard throughout the process. Um, again, just um, very broadly, the bill um, includes a, um, a, a timely payment obligation for uh, for folks who are considered independent um, contractors. Not every uh, person who is considered an independent contractor has been misclassified, but um, the 
timely payment obligations should be obligations that um, all workers receive, whether or not they work for an employer or um, are independently um, contracted. But then also the other um, obligations in the bill, uh, obligations that require advance notice um, to a contract employee um, about what the conditions are for which they will be um, receiving payment um, on the front end, and then on the back end, um, an explanation of, of of why your payment is what it is. These are, you know, these are labor standards that I think regular employees um, take for granted. Um, but in the area of uh, independent contracting, it's these are not uh, standard um, obligations, and they're the kinds of it's kinds of information that um, an independent contractor can look at to help them determine whether or not they are being misclassified um, as um, as a as a, an independent contractor, and it allows them to better advocate for themselves as a worker. The changes in the bill that were in the substitute that we uh, discussed last week um, clarifies that um, the director of OLS has authority to issue rules for the enforcement of this legislation. Um, there are some uh, categories of independent workers that um, have um, this, this uh, rule issuance authority will allow OLS to take a look at. Um, it um, clearly, uh, as was al always intended with the bill, not cover independent contractors when the only relationship between the contractor and the hiring entity is a property rental agreement. That is intended to deal with concerns that we've heard from independent contractor hairstylists who own, whose only relationship with a salon is renting a booth for workspace. Um, it moves the effective date of the legislation uh, to uh, September 2022 at Office of Labor Standards requests. It adds a non-codified section uh, related to um, the standard that um, exists for the Office of Labor Standards to request funding through the budget process directly of the council. Um, the, uh, this is a, a, a special authority that the OLS director has, um, unlike many uh, departments of, of the city, to establish their authority um, so that they can directly identify what their budget needs are and not have to go go through the mayor's office and cues this up as the as the way that the council and and the mayor will deliber deliberate on um, on the enforcement costs associated with this bill. It um, removes platform gig workers from many aspects of the bill, um, although not for timely payment. Those obligations still exist, and this was a this was an amendment that. Um, Councilmember Strauss requested that I that I raise in his absence in committee last weekend, um, in committee last week, um, which I did so and was included in the substitute on, on his request. And um, finally, in line with um, the removal of platform gig workers from many of the aspects of the bill, it also states um, our interest as a council on establishing minimum compensation and other protections like transparency for platform gig workers uh, from late September to the end of 2021. And um, yeah, that, that, that covers the bill. I, I, uh, after, if there are other comments about it, um, Madam Chair, happy to open it up. I, I would like just um, some closing thanks before, um, before we call the vote. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, colleagues, any, other comments, any additional comments on the bill as described by Councilmember Herbold? I don't see any hands raised, so it looks like we're headed right back to you, Councilmember Herbold, for those thank yous. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I just want to, again, underscore my thanks to the Labor Standards Advisory Council for bringing these recommendations forward in the first place. Um, the, uh, the collaboration of the Office of Labor Standards, as well as um, all the external participants that gave input to this bill over the last several months. Um, and a special thanks to uh, Central Staff Karina Bull for her deft analysis and patient policy shepherding and um, uh, special thanks as well to Alex Clardy for his diligent work communicating with many stakeholders and tying up all the other loose ends. 
Thank you so much, Councilmember Herbold. With that, debate is now closed on the bill, and I'm going to ask the clerk please call the roll on the passage of the bill. Lewis? Yes. Morales? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sawant? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Herbold? Yes. Juarez? Aye. Council President Gonzalez? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. The bill passes and the chair will sign it. Will the clerk please affix my signature to the legislation on my behalf? Will the clerk please read item 13 into the record? Agenda, excuse me, the report of the Community Economic Development Committee. Agenda item 13, Council Bill 120092, relating to the regulation of food delivery businesses and platforms, adding a new Chapter 7.30 to Seattle Municipal Code. The committee recommends the bill pass. Thank you so much. Um, colleagues, this is a bill that I have uh, primarily sponsored, but I do um, want to give Councilor Mor Morales as the chair of the committee an opportunity to um, make comments on the bill um, before I do. Uh, thank you, Council President. All I will say is that the bill passed out of committee uh, with five in favor, none opposed, with a recommendation that it do pass, and I will pass it back to you as a sponsor. Thank you so much, Councilor Morales. Um, I am uh, really excited to have an opportunity to bring forward Council Bill 120092, the Fair Food Delivery Bill. I believe that this bill is going to be instrumental in helping restaurants by ensuring their presence on a delivery platform is in their hands and their control and that they can continue to own the guest experience from beginning to end. The guest experience is something restaurants work very hard to build and to execute when restaurants are an unwilling participants on a delivery platform. This creates space for errors, mistakes and misfires that can and do affect the restaurant and also negatively impact the delivery driver when a customer has a negative experience. It is my hope that this will also help del um, delivery drivers by allowing them to just focus on the delivery of food. Uh, when a restaurant isn't a willing participant and there may be an old out of date menu online, for example, drivers become uh, the customer effectively and have to make an order on behalf of, um, uh, of customers that they're bringing food to. So this entire process of ordering, waiting for food, getting the food to its delivery address takes a lot of time and of course reduces income for a driver who has little or no protections or benefits. This is especially made worse as this process can mean a lot of places where an order fails to meet the expectations of the customers despite being well executed by the people at the restaurant or the, or the driver who got the food to the customer. Drivers should not uh, have to suffer financially because of this, nor should restaurants take the hit when they have no idea a customer is ordering from an out of date menu. Other businesses across the city have shared similar um, issues and experiences with platforms. Some of those businesses include Bermarin Heel Tap, Bang Bang Cafe, Cafe Petrioso, Simply Soulful, Chupacabra, and so many others. My office uh, in developing this legislation engaged with Working Washington, Teamsters, hospitality groups like Seattle Restaurant Association and Seattle Restaurants United. Uh, we also engaged with uh, representatives from the delivery platforms directly, and we have also heard directly from uh, other restaurants, all of whom have expressed broad support for this particular piece of legislation. This legislation is very narrowly focused uh, on ensuring restaurants um, are willing participants in the delivery food world, which we know now in uh, pandemic uh, life is become um, the new normal uh, for so many of us here in Seattle. So it's my hope that this bill will help improve and streamline the process of ordering for customers, making the food reflective of an up-to-date menu for restaurants and that delivery drivers can just focus on pickups and making deliveries. So uh, I'm really excited about having an opportunity to bring this forward to you all and wanna um, thank everybody who was on the committee who voted in favor of recommending that the full council pass this legislation. And I also wanna thank Vee Nguyen, my senior policy advisor and Yolanda Ho from our council center staff for their amazing policy work on um, this legislation. And with that colleagues, I hope you'll join me in supporting restaurants by voting yes on council bill 120092. Any additional comments? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll on the passage of the bill? Lewis? Yes. Morales? Yes. Peterson? Yes. 
Sawant. Yes. Strauss. Yes. Herbold. Yes. Juarez. Aye. Council President Gonzalez. Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. The bill passes and the chair will sign it. Will the clerk please affix my signature to the legislation on my behalf? Will the clerk please read items 14 through 19 into the record? Agenda items 14 through 19. Appointments 1920 through 1925. Appointments of Andrew Ashiofu and Deandra Baswell as members of the LGBTQ Commission for term April 30th, 2022. Appointment of Raja Faud as member of the LGBTQ Commission for term to October 31st, 2022. And reappointments of Latesha Corell, Deontay Damper, and Brian Simpson, Simpson, excuse me, Simpson as member Sale LGBTQ Commission for term to April 30th, 2023. The committee recommends these appointments be confirmed. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Councilman Morales, you're the chair of the committee, and I'm going to hand it back over to you to provide uh, the report on these appointments. Thank you. Uh, as uh, Amelia mentioned, uh, these uh, recommendations uh, came with a recommendation to pass uh, and confirm, but I want to share a little bit about uh, the folks who are applying for their appointments. Um, Andrew Ashiofu is a second generation Nigerian American who was born in Houston, but moved back to Nigeria. Um, living under a military dictatorship helped motivate him and informed his community involvement. Since moving back to the States in 2016, Andrew's been actively involved in the Black Lives Matter movement and seeks to join the commission to help give a voice to those at the crossroads of being immigrants and refugees and also LGBTQ. Deandra Broswell uh, is a Black trans non-binary person who is actively involved with the Alphabet Alliance as a mentee. They also collaborated with the Gender Justice Project and Seattle Parks and Rec, currently working downtown at uh, Espresso Vivace. Uh, they are a staunch advocate for social justice and are able to draw from their lived experience as a QD BIPOC to uplift others and inform their activism. Raja Fuad is a non-binary non trans femme person who was born in Saudi Arabia with family from Pakistan. They immigrated to the US and received asylum on the basis of their sexuality. They're now an active member of the LGBTQ community and have extensive involvement with local arts organizations, such as the Seattle Art Museum, McCaw Hall, and MOPOP. Latasha Correll uh, is chair of the uh, People of Color Stakeholder Committee currently on the LGBTQ Commission. Through her strong leadership, the commission, uh, she hopes, will develop a community survey specifically for queer and trans people of color and will continue to work with the Human Services Department in response to the council slide regarding improving homelessness services for the LGBTQ community. Um, Deontay Damper is a Seattle native focused on bringing HIV and AIDS awareness and LGBTQ affirming education to marginalized communities throughout the city of Seattle. Um, this started with work for POCAN as a peer navigator for the Department of Health. In April 2019, Damper made history as the NAACP's first LGBTQIA chair, the first in 110 years of the organization. Um, he is uh, also a Rainier Beach High School um, Black Student Union advisor and has started a support group for young men of color. He now serves as the co-chair of the LGBTQ Commission. And finally, Byram Simpson, Simpson um, is passionate about building bridges between his LGBTQ community and city government and about ensuring the voices of those most marginalized are not only being heard but elevated. Um, the city of Seattle continues to face an emergency centered around housing, which primarily impacts QD BIPOC individuals, and uh, Byram wants to continue his work advocating for them and amplifying their voices. And we are recommending confirmation. Thank you so much, Councilmember Morales. Are there any additional comments on the appointments? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll on the confirmation of appointments 1920 through 1925? Lewis? Yes. Morales? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sawant? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Herbold? Yes. Juarez? Aye. Council President Gonzalez? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. The motion carries and the appointments are confirmed. Will the clerk please read items 20 through 24 into the record? 
Agenda items 20 through 24, appointments 1926 through 1930. Appointment of Hewa Amari as the member of Seattle Disability Commission for term April 30th, 2022. Appointment of Christina Liu as member of Seattle Disability Commission for term April 30th, 2023. Appointments of Don Daly and Taylor Woods as members of Seattle Disability Commission for term April excuse me, October 31st, 2022, and appointment of April Snow as a member of Seattle Disability Commission for term to October 31st, 2021. The committee recommends that the appointments be confirmed. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Councilman Morales, I'm gonna hand it back over to you. Thank you, colleagues. I do wanna share just a little bit about each of these um, candidates. Um, Heowat Amare wants to see people who are the same color as her in positions of leadership and see more people who have disabilities in positions of positions of leadership. Um, she's young, uh, just turned 24, I believe, and still learning about being a leader. Um, but she's worked with King County and Special Olympics team to develop more accessible signage, such as using simpler wording where possible and wants to bring um, that experience to the commission. Christine Liu is a queer neurodivergent disabled Asian American woman, also um, CODA, a child of deaf adults, meaning that both her parents were deaf and her first sign, her first language was ASL. Um, Christine is doing academic research on racial microaggressions and conducting qualitative research on the idea of disability gain, which is the um, advantages that come with having a different, um, differently abled mind or body. Um, and in her volunteer capacity has worked in tent cities and taught deaf and disabled children ASL. Um, she wants to bring her leadership, collaboration, and advocacy skills to the Dis Disability Commission. Dawn is currently pursuing her master's in museology from UW and has extensive experience working in accessibility and advocacy for disabled individuals. She previously worked with UW's Disabilities, Opportunities, Information, and Technology Center to help with universal design technologies and accommodations, specifically in regard to museums, and their ability to provide education through more informal methods um, and wants to bring that experience to the commission. Um, Taylor Woods has spent her entire education and career working for persons with disabilities and or medical conditions. Her passion has always been healthcare for people and children with disabilities. This includes access to healthcare, quality and equitable services, price of care, and healthcare staff who represent the diverse disabled population. Um, and finally, April Snow is a disabled individual who has a long interest in becoming more civically engaged. Um, April has a particular interest in the intersection of race and disability and has a specific interest in advocating for universal design to improve accessibility for everyone, crisis intervention teams to better prepare law enforcement in de-escalation and workplace education so that workplaces are more accepting and accommodating for disabled individuals. And the committee recommends that these confirmations be um, accepted. Thank you so much, Councilmember Morales. Are there any additional comments on the appointments? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll on the confirmation of appointments 1926 through 1930? Lewis? Yes. Morales? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sawant? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Herbold? Yes. Juarez? Aye. Council President Gonzalez? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. The motion carries and the appointments are confirmed. Will the clerk please read items 25 through 28 into the record? Agenda items 25 through 28, appointments 1931 and 1933 through 1935. Reappointment of Jolene Winther Hughes as a member of Salem Music Commission for term to August 31st, 2023. Reappointments of Paula Olivia Nava Madrigal, Judy Rafaela Martinez, and Terry D. Morgan as members of Seattle Music Commission for term to August 31st, 2024. The committee recommends the appointments be confirmed. Thanks so much, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Morales, back to you to walk us through these appointments. Thank you very much. Okay, the Seattle Music Commission. Um, first, we have Jolene Winther Hughes, who's founder and principal of the Hughes Media Law Group, which represents some of the most innovative technology, music, gaming, entertainment, and digital media companies in the world. 
Prior to owning this firm, Jolene served as senior counsel at Real Networks, um, where she was part of a legal team that structured the first legal digital music service and was a pioneer in developing business models of making music available via the internet and mobile devices. Uh, Paula Olivia Nava Madrigal is a cellist and one of a small percentage of female conductors in the country. Um, in addition to conducting orchestra, she teaches classical music to immigrant youth. Um, she is um, uh, holds a BA in music from the University of Guadalajara. Um, and Paula and her husband run two free programs teaching Seattle World Youth Orchestra and the Youth Strings Project Outreach. Um, Paula's co-founder, conductor, and artistic director of the Ballard Civic Orchestra. Judy Rafaela Martinez, also known as Kitty Wu, is the co-director of 206 Zulu, a nonprofit organization that utilizes hip hop culture and arts as an outlet for community empowerment, education, and social change. In 2009, 206 Zulu became an anchor partner in the historic Washington Hall, a venue and community space that has been a hub for notable artists, musicians, activists, and communities of color for 110 years. Kitty Wu has worked with notable local hip hop artists. She's a co-producer of the Cool Out Network, a music program that began airing on Seattle Public Access Television in 1991 to showcase Seattle's hip hop scene. And we have Terry Morgan. Terry started his career in music and African-American studies. His love of culture and performance inspired him to start a production company that produces events celebrating the arts while also developing his own career as a professional musician. Terry is the founder and president of Modern Enterprises LLC and has served clients since 1979, providing talent, production, and technical services for cities, corporate clients, and civic occasions. Terry's experience as a performing musician has strengthened Modern Enterprises' service of booking talent and designing sound environments for events. And he is excited about continuing his position on the Seattle Music Commission. And we recommend the appointments be confirmed. Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Morales, for walking us through those appointments. Are there any additional comments? Hearing no additional comments, will the clerk please call the roll mm -hmm. on the confirmation of appointments 1931 and appointments 1933 through 1935? Lewis? Aye. Morales? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sawant? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Herbold? Yes. Juarez? Aye. Council President Gonzalez. Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. The motion carries and the appointments are confirmed. Will the clerk please read items 29 and 30 into the record? The report of the Governance and Education Committee, agenda items 29 and 30, appointments 1945 and 1946, appointment of Rory O'Sullivan as member of district commission and appointment of Elicio Juarez as member district being commissioned. The committee recommends that these appointments be confirmed. Thank you, Madam Clerk. As chair of the committee, I'll provide the committee a report and then open the floor to comments if there are any. Colleagues, I'm excited to be putting forward these two nominees for our consideration as the city council's appointments to the districting committee, the first ever in the history of uh, the city. Rory O'Sullivan is an administrative law judge with the Washington State Office of Administrative Hearings and an attorney who has worked to protect and advance civil rights throughout his career. In addition, Rory has focused his advocacy and activism on ensuring that democratic and electoral systems are fair and effective. In 2003, he helped found the nonprofit organization Washington Public Campaigns, which is now known as Fix Democracy First. And in 2015, he was one of the authors of the initiative that created Seattle's Innovative Democracy Voucher Program. Rory earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Washington and a Juris Doctorate from Georgetown University School of Law. Eliseo E.J. Juarez has dedicated his career to shaping systems and policies that allow for reflective democracy and maximum participation in governance. E.J. has led stakeholder teams to create policy and rulemaking in the private and public sector, including in his current role as, a, as public policy manager for the Group Health Foundation. Previously, he managed processes that drafted complex proposals with community input in his roles with Solid Ground and United for Fair Representation. He has also served uh, by gubernatorial appointment on the Commission on Judicial Conduct and the Commission on Hispanic Affairs. 
EJ has a bachelor's degree from St. Martin's University and a master's degree from the University of Washington, Bothell, where his research focus was in civic representation and electoral participation. During the application and interview process, EJ and Rory each demonstrated strong commitments to uh, equity, as well as deep knowledge of electoral systems and meaningful experience in organizing communities towards strengthening our democratic institutions and processes. Both appointees appeared in front of the Governance and Education Committee members and uh, provided an opportunity for questions and answers. And after consideration, the um, uh, members of the Governance and Education Committee meeting unanimously recommend the full council adopt these appointments. Are there any additional comments on the appointments? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll on the confirmation of appointments 1945 and 1946? Lewis? Yes. Morales? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Sawant? Councilmember Sawant? Strauss? Yes. Herbold? Yes. Juarez? Aye. Council President Gonzalez? Aye. Seven in favor, none opposed. The motion carries and the appointments are confirmed. Will the clerk please read item 31 into the record? Agenda item 31, appointment to 1939, appointment of Manuela Sly as member Families, Education, Preschool, and Promise Levy Oversight Committee for a term to December 31st, 2023. The committee recommends the appointment be confirmed. Thank you, Madam Clerk. As chair of the committee, I'll provide the committee report and then open up the floor to comments if there are any. I'm really excited for this appointment, the appointment of Manuela Sly to the FAP Families, Education, Preschool, Promise Levy Oversight Committee. Uh, in front of the council today. Manuela is a tremendous advocate and one that my office has had the honor to learn from even before she agreed to step up and uh, serve on the Levy Oversight Committee. Manuela is the current president of the Seattle Council Parent Teacher Student Association and an expert at many levels of the education spectrum from early learning to post-secondary education, as well as community perspective as a parent leader. She brings significant education expertise, especially in bilingual models for learning and instruction. And additionally, she currently runs uh, Gometa Play School, a bilingual preschool right here in West Seattle. Uh, the committee had an opportunity to hear from Director Chappelle on the appointment of Manuela and uh, after consideration recommends that the full council uh, confirm the appointment of Manuela Sly to the Levy Oversight Committee. Are there any additional comments or questions on the proposed amendment? Excuse me, appointment. Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll on the confirmation of the appointment? Lewis? Aye. Morales? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Salant? Strauss? Yes. Herbold? Yes. Juarez? Aye. Council President Gonzalez? Aye. Seven in favor, none opposed. The motion carries and the amendment is confirmed. All right, other business. Is there any further business to come before the council? Hearing no further business to come before the council, this does conclude the items of business on today's agenda. Our next regularly scheduled city council meeting is on June 21st, 2021 at two o'clock PM. I hope that you all have a wonderful afternoon. We're adjourned. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bill. Bye-bye.